Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're out the range with the brand new IWI Carmel rifle. This rifle is pretty interesting because there's not a lot of information out there about this firearm. If you get on Google and start looking for information, you're not going to find anything talking about the history of the gun, the developmental history. You'll be lucky to find internal pictures of what people consider to be the original military version. That's something we need to address in today's video. So let's talk about today's video and what we hope to accomplish. First of all, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of assumptions about this gun out there. I went to the, the, the time and reached out to contacts that I have. They're close to IWI and I reached out to IWI itself people that were actually involved in the development of this rifle, and I can share with you information that's not out there on the internet yet with regards to the history of the gun. So that's something we want to talk about in today's video. Also, we'll talk about the accuracy, we'll talk about how to field strip it, we'll talk about the features, all the good stuff you would expect in a review type video. So let's delve into the history of the gun because this is something I find to be really, really interesting. Being a small arms collector myself, I love the history of firearms that are intended for a military audience like this one, and this one has a really, really cool backstory. American Heart for Gold is dedicated to helping individuals and families invest in precious metals. This includes gold, silver, platinum, in both bars and coins. They provide both physical delivery to one's doorstep or inside of a retirement account like an IRA, 401k, or TSP. American Heart for Gold helps clients achieve greater security for their future by adding a safe haven asset to their portfolio. Investors receive only the highest quality gold and silver coins offered at competitive prices with 100% customer satisfaction guaranteed. American Heart for Gold has an excellent Trustpilot rating from over 1,000 customers. They're A-plus rated with the Better Business Bureau. They have a price match guarantee, a buyback commitment, and free maintenance and storage for up to three years. American Heart for Gold has a special offer for Military Arms Channel viewers of up to $5,000 in free silver on qualified orders. So please call 866-406-1988 today or text MILITARY to 65532. Again, that is 866 866- 406-1988 or text military to 65532. So please swing by and check out American Heart for Gold. I will put a link in the video description below. Let's delve into the history of the gun. So we, when we first got the gun, wanted to start digging around. Now this gun was picked up from a local gun store. This one is not a t and &E gun. We wanted to dig into it. And Jace and I are a bit nerdy, right? We love to dig into stuff. So when we finally get our hands on something new, We'll start tearing it apart. We'll start digging through, see what we can learn about the gun, what we can find that we like, what we dislike. And if you take a look at our text messages, it'll be, this is so cool. Oh my gosh, this, this sucks. Oh, this is so cool. And it's just roller coaster ride as we learn more about the firearm. This gun was particularly frustrating to learn about because there's just not any information out there about it. And so I thought, well, heck, I need to reach out to somebody that might know something about it. I have a couple of different sources that I reached out to, and I spent several hours on the phone going over the history of the gun. And that's what I'm going to convey to you now. This is information I've not found anywhere else on the internet. And hopefully this information winds up in other videos and content so people can have the backstory on the gun. With that being said, this gun started life around 2014. I think I first learned of it about 2017 and I started trying to follow the development of the gun. It was hard to follow because the development started stopped several times throughout its history. Keep in mind, going back to 2014, this thing is almost a decade old right? Maybe even older. I don't know when they technically officially started development, but the original gun was developed in 7.62x39 for a military tender, and IWI was, IWI was chasing that military contract. Well, the contract went away, and when it did, the development on the gun stopped. It got shelved. And later, the gun would be brought back to life because of another opportunity, and they would convert it from 7.62x39 to 5.56, a NATO standard, which would be more appealing to a broader military audience because IWI does manufacture guns like this for export. And so they brought it back as a 5.56. Now, of those rifles, the pictures that you see out there on the internet, the few that you're going to find, are all of this early prototype that's pretty old, coming up on a decade old. The gun was never put into production. Maybe 10 of those early prototypes that we associate with the look of the Carmel exist, and they were just built as proofs of concept. Again, they never were put into production. Around 2017, a little later maybe, uh, new management at IWI US came in, and they went to Israel, and they started talking to Israel about their various product offerings, and one of the things that they had seen on display but not really talked about was the Carmel. And so the U.S. folks were like, tell us more about that rifle. And so they dove into the, the gun. And the United States side of IWI thought that this gun might have a market here in the U.S., something I would agree with. Bring me all the guns from overseas. 
And so they, they got to talking with IWI Israel, and they decided to further develop the gun. Now, again, those first early 10 prototypes would have features that people would associate with the military version, right? And this is a trap that I fell into in previous videos talking about, don't Americanize my gun, bro. This gun wasn't Americanized. It was just developed co uh, in collaboration with Americans. So that's why it has more American features in its current iteration. So the early gun would have the polymer handguards that slide off like a Scorpion Evo, the covers, and you get pick rails underneath it. It was shorter. The gas system protruded from the end of the handguard. It, it looked sharp with its short barrel. It had like an 11 or 12 inch barrel. With a 16 inch barrel, that handguard would look a little bit dorky. And plus it limited the rail space and it didn't have M lock that we see now on the current handguard. This handguard is actually lighter than the polymer version of the gun of the prototypes. And so the gun went through a development cycle where the United States was giving its input to Israel and they modified the gun considerably from those early prototypes to where we see it today. This is the natural evolution of the Carmel. This is not an Americanized gun. This is just a gun in its current iteration with American assistance in its development. Big difference there, right? If you go back to the IWI ACE, the IWI ACE came in in its export configuration, a military configuration, early on. A few years later, they brought it out the Gen 2. That is an Americanized rifle. That gun has M-Lock rails on it and things like that that might appeal to an American audience to try to boost the sales of the gun because once the military collectors got the ACEs, I would imagine the sales started to peter off. They certainly did for us over at Copper Custom. And so this gun isn't in the same league as the ACE. This is just the Carmel. All right, so with the history of the gun being out of the way, let's talk about some of the features of the gun and where there are some differences from the early prototypes I'll point out while going over the features of this particular gun, at least those areas that I'm familiar with based on my conversations with IWI. All right, so let's go over some of the features of the Carmel. First, let's start off at the butt and then move our way to the muzzle. Back here, we have a stock that is very reminiscent of either the SCAR or the ACR. And again, we did a video talking about that. And so we have adjustable length of pull, have a little lever here, and you have six preset locking points, so you can adjust the length of pull. We also have claw connection points on both sides of the stock back here for a sling. Coming forward, we have a adjustable cheek riser here, and then you have tabs on both sides that you can pinch simultaneously, and then you can lift this up and it has preset positions. There's four or so of those preset positions so that you can raise this up to meet your cheek in, or put your cheek in the proper position for whatever optic you happen to be using. The stock also folds to the side. And so like the SCAR or the ACR, you have a big button over here, you push that and it folds to the side. Now it does not lock. It has a little bit of a detent there. It does not lock. This is intended for storage. Yes, the gun fires just fine with the stock folded, even though it's not the purpose of the stock folding. So to deploy it, the reason it doesn't have a latch is because it, most people want this stock to quickly deploy and not have to fight with a latch of any, any sort because again, it's just meant for that storage. All right, so then moving forward, we have QD mounts back here on the receiver on both sides. And then moving forward, we have a pick rail across the top. This pick rail bolts down onto the receiver, but the original monolithic piece, if you will, only runs to about out here and then the handguard takes over. So there's a little section out here that is 1913 rail attached to the handguard and the rest of it, it's all one piece here on top. The receiver itself, is polymer, so it's very G36-ish in that regard, right? You have polymer all the way back here. It has the same pebble pattern as the X95, and then we have a polymer lower. We have ambi fire controls, so we have a truncated lever here on the right-hand side, a full-size lever over here. It's a quarter throw selector lever. Here we have a B5 Systems pistol grip, so the original rifle would have had its own proprietary pistol grip. The gun's been modified to accept AR-15 pistol grips, and this will continue on because IWI is now bringing this gun back to try to sell it on the export market. And the features that you see here are gonna be on the new generation of the gun. So this is not, again, just for the American market. So you have that quarter throw. And then inside we have a trigger, which we'll talk about during the disassembly, but the trigger is changed. The original prototype had a completely different trigger in it. They modified the trigger to improve the trigger pull, it has a very, very good trigger in it. And it's based on the AK. Moving forward, have an ejection port buffer here, a polymer port cover, we have a bolt hold bolt release over on the right hand side. So if you push on the bottom, pull the bolt to the rear, it'll lock to the rear, push on top and the bolt will drop. Magazine release in a you know regular spot where you'd expect it to be for a Stenag type magazine, which this uses. 
And then on this side, we have the larger ping pong paddle push down on the bottom, pull the bolt to the rear. It'll lock the bolt and carrier to the rear, push on the top. It'll release it. Magazine release, ambi, right here on the left-hand side. Moving forward, we have the now aluminum rail out here. And so we have M-lock here. Now, this is a very tall, thick gun. I generally make guns look small in my hands. This one looks normal size because it's such a big gun. It's not a heavy gun. It just looks big. All right, so we have M-lock up here. It's got two rows at the 3 o'clock one at the six o'clock, and then two rows over here at the nine o'clock. It's also interesting to note that the charging handle, which is non-reciprocating, is attached to a sled. So when this comes to the rear manually, you're pulling the sled rearward and you can see light through, this, through the opening, okay? But when the gun cycles, when the bolt is locked to the rear and the, and, and the action is actually cycling, this is non-reciprocating, so it stays forward. As you can see, the bolt's back and we don't see light through here. That's because this sled is blocking the ingress of debris. This is another change. If you look at early prototype images of the gun being fired and the bolt slightly back because they caught it mid-cycle, you're going to see light through there. They changed that to keep the crud out of the action. Another cool feature is you'll see this opening right here on both sides. To change the charging handle, you just pull it back to where that, that cutout is and just push. And now your charging handle is on the other side. Very slick. You don't even have to field strip it to change where, that, how it uh, charges, all right? Very, very cool. Coming out here, we have a gas regulator, which we can access through the handguard. The handguard is held in place by three screws. We'll talk about that when we get to the field stripping or disassembly of the gun. It has two positions. Now, people are going to say, well, the original military version, which doesn't exist, had three positions. It had regular, had suppressed, and then it had adverse. That's not true. And this is where IWI kind of gets into trouble itself. So the people that run the website will put stuff out about prototypes, which the information about the Carmel on the IWI website is talking about a prototype. It's not talking about the features of the current generation of the gun, but they put information out there, I think, mistakenly saying that it had a suppressed setting, a regular setting, and an adverse setting. It never did. The people involved with the program said it, it, that never was made. What was made was regular, suppressed, and off. They took the off position away, just making it a two position regulator, because how do you, what, what do you use an off setting for, right? You have suppressor, you have regular, don't need an off setting. So that's why it's been simplified to two positions. Now, I would like to see it with an adverse setting, because that might address the issue that we found with one particular flavor of ammunition, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the video. Now we have a lightweight profile barrel. People say we want the military profile. This is the military profile, because this is the current profile of the gun. And then on the end, we have the muzzle device, which is very much like the early pictures of the uh, of the gun. So we also have the magazine well down here, which has been flared. The original prototype had a 90 degree right angle. So doing mag changes was a little bit difficult because if you didn't come in perfectly straight, it would hit the wall. So it was beveled, making mag changes easier for the gun. Also, it should point out over here on the right hand side of the bolt carrier, there's a divot in there. So it's like an HK style of forward assist. If the gun isn't completely in battery, you just kind of reach into that divot and push on the bolt carrier and you should be able to get the, the gun into battery. If you can't, that means the round's bad. Just jack it out, put a fresh round in. All right, I think that's all of the features of the Carmel. Now let's move over and doing some more shooting with it, talk about the disassembly, and just have some good, have a good time with this gun and see what it does accuracy-wise, because this is really interesting. Another point I should point out is that this one has a barrel that's held in place by a LMT-style clamp, where you have two screws, metal clamp clamping the barrel. The original prototype had a quick change barrel like the ARX 100 or 160. They got rid of that because of accuracy issues. The guns were shooting five inch groups and they wanted to get it tighter. And we'll talk about how they were successful in improving the accuracy of the Carmel in this video as well. We fired a number of different flavors of 5.56 and 223 through the Carmel to get some idea of what the accuracy potential of the gun is. Now keep in mind, this version of the Carmel has that barrel. It's held like an LMT style clamp with two screws. It's user serviceable. You can definitely change your barrel fairly quickly with the use of tools, but they got rid of the quick change barrel system to improve the accuracy. If it, the accuracy of the prototypes was anything like the ARX 100, it was a good thing getting rid of the quick change barrel system, which to me has no real practical purpose. With that being said, let's start off with the 77 grain AAC. This is the new Palmetto State Armory ammunition brand. This is some of their match ammo, five shot group. This is gonna be a little over an inch for five shots. 
Over here, we have some 55 grain Federal uh, American Eagle. We had one flyer up here, and then the rest of them landed down here, five shot group. And that's pretty average for ball, especially American Eagle, which is just range ammunition, not, not sold as uh, match ammo. Over here, 77 grain AAC and a five shot group, pretty close to two inches, I'd say. 69 grain, now we have some five shot groups, some three shot groups because we have very limited resources in terms of match ammo for 5.56. So with the 69 grain federal gold medal match, I only fired a three shot group through the same hole, one here, definitely within an inch. 77 grain X-TAC, again, uh, limited resources, two through the same hole, one here, right around an inch, very comparable performance between the two. Another thing you're gonna see is with the different ammo flavors and bullet weights, all these impacts are pretty much right in the pasty or near it with the exception of this one, which wound up causing an adjustment to the scope. So it, it's being very consistent between the different flavors of ammo in terms of where the bullet actually impacts. And then last over here, we have a 77 grain AAC, five shot group, four rounds, pretty close to an inch with that occasional flyer that opens things up a bit. So. My assessment of the accuracy of the gun is it's good. It's not exciting, it's not exceptional, at least in the version that we have, but it definitely, in terms of fighting rifles, is giving good performance, performance that I would be happy with. All right, so let's take the gun apart. What's really interesting about taking new guns like this apart is finding out where they're similar to previous designs, and this gun has a lot of similarities to some pretty popular other rifles. All right, so first I wanna make sure the weapon is empty, so I have removed the magazine. And now I'm just gonna pull rearward on the bolt a little bit, check that chamber, make sure there's nothing in there, and the gun is empty. The handguard's sliding off because I've started the disassembly on it. So, once you've done that, this is not necessary, but I'm gonna show you this anyway. I've taken three screws out of the handguard. These are the three screws. When you go to put them back in, the manual recommends put some more Loctite on them and torque them down to about 35 inch pounds. That'll keep the screws from backing out. But you don't need to take this handguard off as part of your regular maintenance. You can access the gas system right through the handguard. No reason to take it off. All right, unless you just wanna clean your gas piston, which doesn't require a whole lot of maintenance. So once you have the screws out, this just slides off. But now you can see the barrel, the gas system of the gun. You know, it's a very light profile barrel, very skinny back here, thickens up just a little bit here. Again, it's cold hammer forged, one seven twist. All right, so now that we have that off, just to show you that. Next, this is very similar to the ARX100 or the Brita ARX160, very similar to the SCAR, very similar to the ACR and how it takes apart. And that is you swing your stock to the side and now you can take out the guts from the receiver, all right? What's different about this design is this is your latch that the stock latches onto to keep it in extended position, but this also doubles as a takedown. So I'm gonna push in on this and release some of the recoil pressure. I'm gonna pull on this tab on the latch, I'm gonna pull it all the way out till it pops and then it'll release this rear piece. And now you can slide the bolt and carrier out. And boy, that looks familiar. Where have I seen that before? I'll show you here in a minute. All right, so once you got that out, uh, you can then, if you want, take the pistol grip off. Very easy to do. It's one single takedown pin. You can actually just use the tip of a bullet. Push that across, hinge this down. And in the front, you have cutouts here because it's gonna wrap around a pin a metal pin that runs through the receiver extension here. This is metal, that pin runs through there. This just sets on that. And it's very similar to the ARX100. So you just kind of set it in there and then just rotate this up and push your pin across. All right, so here's your lower, all polymer, very lightweight. There's that standard AR-15 pistol grip. You can see the selector levers. Here you can see the trigger mechanism. Now what's interesting about this is it's more AK-ish than AR. This is a hook, like a single hook AK trigger. This is what releases it. It, it attaches to the side of the hammer here. This is your disconnector. So when it comes back, you'll see the hook catches it. And then when you pull the trigger, you can see that hook move and it releases the hammer. All right. So it won't use standard AR-15 triggers. It has a proprietary trigger in it. All right, so that's really it. Now you can get in there and clean your receiver. Um, if you want, you can take your barrel out. It's just clamped right here. But again, that's stuff that you don't really need to do as part of your regular maintenance of the gun. For those of you that like to take your bolt and carrier apart part, as part of your maintenance, this part is for you. All right, so here's your bolt and carrier system. And it's very similar to what you're gonna see that's already out there in terms of how you take it apart, very reminiscent of the AR-15. You're also gonna notice it has dual ejectors and then a standard AR-15 style extractor over here. So, and the AR-15 style bolt, all right? Different, you're not gonna use an AR-15 bolt in this gun but it's definitely borrowing from that design. All right, so to take this apart, you have a firing pin back here. You have a firing pin safety. These are very common these days. You're gonna see them on things like the Sig Virtus and stuff like that. And then we have a takedown pin 
right here. So I'm going to hold the firing pin in. I'm going to push on that pin, pull this all the way over. It definitely wants to fight with you a little bit. Oops. And the pin comes right out and out. And then you can take the firing pin out. Now you will notice the firing pin has a spring on it to prevent slam fires. And then when you come over to the other side, just like the AR-15, this is your cam pin. You can see the cam slot on it. This also rides on a slot in the receiver. You just pull this out and you're going to notice on the very base of it, it's cut in such a way that it's going to tell you when it's properly inserted facing the right way. When you put it in, you just rotate it until it sets all the way down and then you'll know that it's in right. So then your firing pin will go in and it'll hold the whole system together. And then of course your bolt comes out. As you can see, that is not a standard AR-15 bolt. So now let's shoot the Carmel with the OSS on the suppressor setting. Now these are low back pressure cans, but they still have a little bit of back pressure. Let's see if it's enough to operate the gun. Since this is a brand new gun to the U.S. market, let's do a quick magazine test with some popular brands of magazines that are available on the U.S. market. So first off, we have a P-Mag that has an over-insertion tab on the rear of it. So let's go ahead and put that in. Now the ammunition we're using is 55 grain American Eagle. Magazine drops free. This is a Lancer Systems with more 55 grain American Eagle. Find the button. Mag drops free. This is a P Mag with no over insertion tab. Regular Stenag Magazine. And then the D60 from Magpul. So we have no issues with all the popular brands of magazines that uh, would make the gun not work as designed. Seems like it likes them all. So now let's talk about the one issue that we ran into with this particular Carmel rifle. Now this may not translate into other guns that are out there, but this is something that uh, jumped right out at us because of the ammunition that we typically use out here at the Mac range, which is Federal 62 grain 223. We jump between 55 grain and 62 grain. Now I have used the 62 grain Federal ammunition in just about every gun you've ever seen on the Military Arms Channel and never had a problem with it. So when I started having short stroking problems with this rifle, I thought, uh-oh, maybe the gun's a bit under-gassed. But then we started testing it with all other flavors of 223 and 556. 77 grain match, 69 grain match, 55 grain ball, uh, M855, M193. All the different flavors of ammunition that we tried all worked fine. It was just this particular flavor of 62 grain Federal, which is just range ammo. It's not super hot. It didn't like. Now, Jason, this is current stuff. This is stuff I've gotten in the last three or four months. Jason has some stuff that dates back to 2017, 2018, 62 grain stuff that we've been using again for years without issue. And he ran some of the older stuff than this ammo through it with the same results. So it just seems to be that particular load. What could be causing it? Well, peak pressures in the barrel where the gas port is, things like that all play a factor. Think of the M1 Garand. You have M1 Garand specific ammunition, and that's because the, the people that are loading ammo are trying to keep that pressure spike up towards the end of the barrel where the gas system is, where it taps gas off to operate the gun. And it just might be a matter of where this is peaking in pressure. It's not doing it near the gas port, and so it's just being a little bit under gassed. And this is where that third position might come in handy if there were an adverse setting with a third position. I could give it a little extra gas, and then I wouldn't have to worry about uh, ammunition. Now, what's interesting is I don't have any Tula, but in talking to IWI, they said that they shot it a lot with steel case Tula, which is 
underpowered 223. This stuff is generally hotter and the gun works just fine. I don't have any more Tula because they cut off importation. The price is getting crazy. So I don't really have the ability to test that, but I have no reason to, to doubt that they tested it with that particular ammo. So that's it. That's the one thing that, that we ran into with this particular gun. To me, it's not that big of an issue. I'll just shoot different ammo, but it was something that, um, would cause me to say, hey guys at IWI, maybe give us that third position or maybe open up that gas port just a little bit. And But in doing that, you may mess with the dynamic of the gun, which is like perfectly balanced, right? The way the gun handles, it looks big and bulky, but it handles and shoulders so nicely. The recoil impulse on the short stroke gas piston gun is really, really tame. I mean, it is the softest shooting gas piston, short stroke gas piston gun I've ever fired. Outstanding. So do I really want to open up the gas port for that one particular ammo? No, just give me that third position. All right, with all that being said, the guns retail for right around 1600 bucks or so. So they're rather pricey. And if you're looking for a fighting rifle and you're not a military collector saying, well, maybe I should look at this versus an AR-15, most people are just gonna go for that five, $600 PSA AR-15 and forego the $1,600 gun they've never heard of before. So this gun really appeals to military collectors like myself. It's probably not going to put much of a dent in the AR-15 market, especially at the price point that it has to be at, being a brand new firearm with lots of R&D to pay for. So overall, what do I think of it? I love the gun, guys. I really do. It's so interesting. Again, it's in the same vein as the ACR SCAR, something I like. I like the features of those firearms. And it's made by IWI, who has a long history of thoroughly testing their products in adverse conditions and everything else. And I've been a big fan of IWI products going back to my early childhood when they went by IMI on the U.S. market. So if you're looking for one, I don't think you're going to be disappointed in picking one up. I will follow up with the 62 grain issue with IWI and see if there's a fix or whatever. I'm going to measure some port sizes and things like that. I'll report back to what the findings are there. But overall, again, an outstanding gun, full features. Uh, you know, if you can work around the rather big bulky nature of the gun and just go feel the ergonomics of it, handle it shouldered if you see it somewhere and, and consider it in that light, I think you're probably going to like the gun. I certainly do. All right, guys, I look forward to your comments down below. If you have any questions or comments, we try to stick around for the first couple of days and answer those comments or questions in the comment section down below. If you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, the best way to do that is become part of our Patreon family. There is a link in the video description. Also, if you'd like to support us in the age of demonetization here on YouTube, there's a join button and a, a thanks button underneath the video player you're watching right now. Mash either one of those buttons and support us right here on YouTube in the age, again, of demonetization. Last but not least, we, uh, please swing by and check out Copper or Custom. That's a mouthful. And thank you for 15 years of support. We'll talk to you guys soon.